Once the C-Lab program went away, the technology didn't go away. Like, let them really feel the history of what these old Aquanauts went through, the weight of some of this equipment. Some of the best things that come out of the ocean can help lots and lots of people. So why are we not exploring that? In the 1960s, the United States and the Soviet Union embarked on an epic race fueled by a fierce determination to conquer space and plant their flag on the moon. The world held its breath as eyes turned skyward, fixated on a new frontier. But amidst this cosmic frenzy, a group of daring explorers plunged into the depths of Earth's last great frontier. Welcome to the ocean, an expanse covering over 70% of our planet's surface. A world of untapped resources, teeming with life and crisscrossed by the arteries of global trade. Beneath its surface lies unimaginable wealth, vast deposits of minerals, metals, and mysterious energy sources yet to be discovered. And hidden within its depths are the scores of marine life that hold the key to scientific and medical breakthroughs. But make no mistake, the ocean is unforgiving. In some respects, Walking on the moon seems more attainable than reaching the abyssal depths of the Mariana Trench. Enter Sea Lab, the groundbreaking project that dared to push the boundaries of human knowledge. Through three daring missions, Sea Lab 1, 2, and 3, Navy divers and intrepid scientists embarked on a voyage of discovery. In the depths, they conducted experiments, unraveling scientific enigmas and unearthing the secrets of the deep. George Bond was sure that despite the body's weaknesses and vulnerabilities, divers could adapt to the harsh environment of the ocean depths. On July 19, 1964, Sea Lab was lowered onto the ocean floor and the aquanauts rode down in the diving bell. Sea Lab aimed to examine how living and working in pressurized underwater habitats for extended periods, known as saturation diving, affects the human body. During saturation diving, people stay in these habitats for weeks, allowing their bodies to adjust to the high pressure. They breathe a special gas mixture to survive the depths where regular oxygen levels can be harmful. Too much oxygen under high pressure can lead to a condition called oxygen toxicity. Saturation diving became the chosen path to unravel the ocean's mysteries. It forced humans to adapt to an alien environment. Living and working in pressurized underwater habitats for extended periods, these aquanauts underwent remarkable transformations, including increased red blood cell production and changes in bone density. They pushed the limits of human physiology all in the quest to unlock the ocean secrets. 192 feet down on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, the United States Navy conducts an experiment to test man's ability to live and work underwater. A 40-foot pressurized helium and oxygen filled undersea laboratory is home for four Navy divers. Activity in the sea lab is monitored by closed circuit television linked to the circuit. I'm 84 years old, I'm the last and standing from Sea Level 1. We're inside the Sea Lab 1 habitat on display at the Manistee Museum, Panama City Beach. Give you an idea what the interior was like. The mission Sea Lab 1 was to prove Captain Bond's theory of saturation diving, which revolutionized commercial, military, recreational diving. My primary job in the Navy was a dive photographer, both still and film. We got involved with Sea Lab for photography because we were the only show in town. My first experience diving to the bottom was pretty easy. I had done some deep scuba diving. What I captured on a dive was an overall shot to the habitat. Usually I time them to the aquanauts a new word would be out doing something. Footage of Dr. Thompson coming out work with an underwater weather station. Occasionally I did my dive, I had a lot of time. I'd go up, put my head up into the shelter and yell something at him. So I did 18 dives on the whole project, 18 dives for 130 feet, which is considered the safe limit for scuba diving in the Navy ever since. Life says always do your best work because you may outlive you. Now I will say the Sea Lab program set the groundwork for saturation diving, and it wouldn't be where it's at today without the, these pioneers uh, being the guinea pigs of some of these tests and some of the 
the, the living conditions that they had to live in. And, and that continues on today, and thanks to these great aquanauts that we had. One of the great things that came from Sea Lab was saturation diving and the limits that were imposed on there and breathing helium because uh, normal air with nitrogen in it at about 200 feet it starts becoming narcosis. Start getting this drunk effect and at 300 feet you're wasted. So to be able to switch to helium, a helium mixture, uh, you get a squeaky voice but that narcotic effect is gone and you can dive for long periods under the ocean on a helium oxygen mix and that was thanks to the Sea Lab program. The Navy harnessed the power of underwater habitats to study and develop cutting-edge underwater technologies, including revolutionary communication systems, advanced diving equipment, and Tuffy, the scrappy bottlenose dolphin. Today, the Navy Diving and Salvage Training Center carries the torch of Sea Lab's legacy. In their state-of-the-art facilities, divers are trained, and research and development push the boundaries of diving technology. The quest to conquer the unknown continues with scientists testing and refining equipment to protect those who dive ever deeper. Enter the Naval Surface Warfare Center's Hydrospace Laboratory, an epicenter of research and testing. In Panama City Beach, Florida, they subject equipment to extreme conditions, pushing the limits to ensure the safety of those who venture into the heavens or descend into the deep. The Sea Lab project, starting with Sea Lab 1, Sea Lab 1 project actually started here in, in Panama City at this Naval Lab here not a huge budget project, so um, kind of used what we had. And there was a lot learned from that project across the board about saturation diving. And then that, that whole project, as it you know, went from Sea Lab 1 to Sea Lab 2, Sea Lab 2 to Sea Lab 3, they, they began to understand what is needed in that space. Um, so certainly a lot was learned, but the biggest thing was decompression and how the body is affected by that and what we can do and how we can mitigate those things. As a laboratory here, we've helped build stuff for NASA and that's life support related, astronauts in particular, and then stuff for the Navy um, just because of our life support experience. So there's, there's a lot of crossover there. Saturation diving is, it's hard on the body. You gotta train your body for that. Uh, years ago, the Navy used to have saturation in school we used to have saturation platforms, we used to have chambers, and we used to have vessels that we could go on. Anyway, the Navy got away from that. So now we're go on these jobs with current saturation divers and old saturation divers that are civilians, and we learn on the job training. By living underwater for extended periods, researchers delve into the mysteries of human physiology. Leading the charge is Dr. Joseph Deturi director of the International Board of Undersea Medicine. In partnership with the Marine Resources Development Foundation Marine Lab, he embarked on a daring 100-day mission entering the habitat on March 1st, 2023, and surfacing on June 9th. We are at the Jules Verne Undersea Habitat, and we've been here on day 67 of 100 days total. We're going to stay underwater for 100 days. Now, the 100 days is not necessarily about breaking the record, because the world record is 73 straight days. So we're staying for 100, and why? The reason why is because I want to do biomedical experiments on myself. And the 100 days is because I can't afford 200 days. 200 days is the length of time that it's going to take us to get from here to Mars. 2018, bottom of the Marianas Trench, there had been three people. James Cameron, August Picard, and Don Wolf. That's it. We had spent 77 person years in space. 77 person years in space. That's a, uh, an individual goes up for a period of time, it gets counted, right? 77 total years and we have learned, what? that's hard, what? And zero gravity? And where do they train all the astronauts? In the water, right? You don't go to space to train, you get in the water to train. So why aren't we just doing habitats here, simulated this isolated, confined, extreme environment? We live in the ocean right now. We are literally living in the ocean. And this place is all about scientific problems, technological problems, engineering problems, mathematical problems. And we need the future of the world to get on board and start solving these problems. Underwater exploration is hard. 
It's hard when you don't know how to do it. It's hard when people don't get it. It's that kind of reasoning why we need to live in the ocean, figure out what's here, sample it, get the planetary biodiversity, show what it is, and then we catalog it. Sea Lab 1 was exceptionally successful. Sea Lab 2 was, Sea Lab 1 was so successful, and Sea Lab 2 went off so well, and it was so popular, and popular mechanics, and yeah, we're living underwater, that the line community, the line officer community got it. And once they got it, all those procedures went out the window and Barry Cannon died and that was the end of the U.S.'s dream to live in the ocean, populate the ocean. But there's so many good things that can come from the ocean. We get between 60 and 70 percent of our oxygen from the world's oceans and if we don't take care of this place, it's not going to help us. Many, many, many disease cures come out of the ocean. Acyclovir, it's a drug uh, that we use as an antiviral. It's a pretty powerful antiviral comes from a sponge, derived from a sponge. Antifreeze, antifreeze. Do you know that fish actually swim under the Arctic Circle? They have natural antifreeze. Super glue, guess what? Barnacles stick really freaking hard. Why can't we use something like that as a super glue? We found a partial cure for Alzheimer's that existed at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Nobody knew it was there until we found it. So we went, we looked for it, but it existed. If we found that there, we have the yin, we have the yang. We have the dark, we have the light. We have the disease. We absolutely have the cure. We just have to go find it. Ideas and solutions emerge from the shadows, fueling our resilience in the face of earthbound and extraterrestrial challenges. As we race to the moon and beyond, we also test our physical and mental fortitude in an environment here on Earth, ensuring our survival in both alien worlds.